first generation of the church was very, very important to them. I don't know why I did that. Give you some examples. In Acts 1.14, it was the prayer that the free church continually participated leading up to the day of Pentecost. Prayer meant something. In Acts 2.42, the prayer of the church was continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. In Acts 3.1, Peter and John were going up to the temple to participate in an hour of prayer. By the way, the song we're going to have in the invitation is Sweet Hour of Prayer. In Acts uh, 4.31, the Christians were praying in one accord. That's not a Honda accord. That they're in harmony, okay? And they're praying on behalf of the incarcerated Peter in Acts 12, 5. And 1 Corinthians 11, 4 confirms the first generation of assembled saints prayed together. And James 5, 14, the elders would come together for the church to pray for them. And so prayer was incredibly important in the first century church. Well, Luke chapter 11, verse 1, some of the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. The us, the plural, just as John also taught his disciples. Prayer isn't something that just comes naturally. It's just not going to come naturally. You have to have, like, your mind in it somehow. And and so apparently John the Baptist taught his disciples a specific way to pray as the us, and the disciples of Jesus wanted that also. The response is what Jesus had was called the Lord's Prayer. In the, in the Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, that version of it, Jesus said, pray then in this way. This is the word tupos. It means a pattern, a pattern. There is a pattern of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now Jesus isn't saying have a recitation of this. That's not what it's about. If you haven't memorized, great. Then you should be able to follow along quite well. But we know from the previous verses, God doesn't want vain repetitions from us. So by you just simply repeating the pattern, if you, if you lay down at night and you say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay, that's great. Okay, you just told God you know the pattern. Okay, what are you going to do with the pattern now? You see the difference? And so... In this pattern of prayer, this has a corporate mindset to it. You'll see this. Notice what it says all throughout. Our, is that plural or singular? Plural. Okay, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us, is that plural or singular? Plural. Our, plural. Our, plural. Our, plural. Us. Plural, us, plural, thine is the kingdom of power. Glory. Okay, so every single reference to humans in here is plurality. Because Jesus is addressing it as a group. And so, many times in the Bible which deal with prayer, uh, a lot of Bible uh, verses deal with prayer. But Jesus is teaching corporate prayer. And prayer is divided into four different categories here. There's the prioritizing. That's the first thing. The prioritizing. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're to prioritize God in our prayer. When we get up here, if you're a man and you're leading the prayer, we need to make sure that we're addressing, that we understand the prioritizing. It's about God, his person, his name. If you start out with prayer from the very beginning, dear God, I want this and this and this. That's kind of you sent. It's we start out with prayer talking about God. Paternity, you know, his person. You have uh, paternity. He's our father. 
You know, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, that we might become the sons of God. He's our, he's our Father. We cry, out, we cry out, Abba, Father. We're not only born into the family of God, but he's also adopts us just to make sure we don't get off the hook. Okay? So we need to address that in our prayer. When we say, dear Father, what does that mean? That means quite a bit. I don't know about you, but God says that fathers take care of their kids. Now, he'd be the biggest cosmic failure if he'd tell us to take care of our kids and didn't take care of us. And so there's also protection. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. I know about me, and I have a feeling this is about you. But if one of your kids needs protection, are you going to let them down? No. When Trent broke his second foot, okay? Now, did, did you just say walk it off, Tanya? No? <laughs> no, we go to protection. You know, God doesn't want people messing with his children. And so we get protection from him. We also get punishment. That's the other side. That's another P word, punishment. Uh, God tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 that uh, in the King James Version that if, if, a fa if God didn't punish us, teach us in that way, we'd be nothing more than bastards is what it says. We'd be a bastard without a father. The fatherless and the widows. God gives us punishment. There's no punishment that seemeth good, but it yieldeth peaceable fruits to those that are exercised thereby. So when we talk about God, we need to be addressing all these. In perspective, our Father who art in heaven, where is he who art in heaven? He's not like down here. I mean, he has a heavenly view. He sees it all. I mean, he sees it better than if we had an ant farm or something. He can see it all. The ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all of his goings. There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom he had to do. So the bottom line is this, is that when we're praying, try a pattern. We get together. This is cheese pizza worship right here. We get together and we're praying with, uh, to God as a group. We need to focus on his person. God, I want to thank you so much because you're my father. You know, I didn't grow up with a father, but God, you're my father. I'm a father. And Lord, I know you're going to protect me. I shall not, I shall be brave. I shall be courageous because I know you're looking out for me. Because you want me to look out for my kids, and I know you look out for your kids. And I thank you for that protection. And Lord, please help me never forget that you're also the father who disciplines. You'll deal out the punishment. And God, thank you that you're not down here on earth like I'm down here on earth. You hold a heavenly perspective. You sit on your throne where they say, without end, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. That you are the awesome God and you're looking down directly at us and you know exactly what's going on. God, thank you so much for being who you are, God. You are not a thing. You are a person. You are my Father. And hallowed be thy name. That's the next one in the pattern of prayer. We see hallowed be God's name. The word hallowed is hagiazo in the Greek. And basically what it means is, is to set apart, to sanctify. Basically, it's saying that if you hallow something, if you sanctify something, you know, if you have a very special place like a china hutch or a cedar chest or a safe, whatever, you only put important things in there. You notice that? You set it apart from the common stuff. You know, you, if you have a safe at home, you probably don't put your junk mail in it. You're putting birth certificates, pictures. You don't want to burn up in a fire. That means to be sanctified. 
And so we are to sanctify God's name after we recognize his personage in our life. Those qualities that stand out to us, we set his name aside because his name is above every name that hath been named. We magnify thy name is what David says. Here's another thing, a good example of David hallowing God's name, setting God's name aside. He said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is thine, and thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. You see, he's bragging about God. He's bragging about God. You take all those things that God is. God, you're the creator of the universe. You own the patent on the DNA, God. I thank you so much, God. You are special. You are real special. You're not like blue light special. You are absolutely king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're ahead of In fact, King James, one of the versions, says, Thou doth exalt thyself. What? Yeah, God's bragging about him. If God walked in front of a mirror, he goes, you're awesome. And you're thinking, well, that's kind of big guy. No, it's true. He's awesome. Holy and reverend is his name. That's why you don't call me reverend. No. Because that's his name. You see, his name needs to be hallowed. We need to set it apart. That's very important at the beginning of prayer. When a man <laughs> leads a prayer up here for worship, we should try to... to, to to recognize who God is and to glorify his name because prayer starts with God because it's about God. But then there's a second part to it. There is the program. The program. Huh. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now what's the program of God concerning our prayers? It's very simple. Thy kingdom is first one, and thy will. There's the plan right there. Why are we even praying this, Lord? What are we praying this for? Because it's thy kingdom. The word for kingdom is basilica. It's what it means, king, kingdom. And when we're in God's kingdom, you know, we're a kingdom of priests, as the Bible says. And before... By the way, this prayer was being taught before the kingdom, which is the church, started. And so all the references prior to that to the kingdom was something that was coming. Matthew 3, 2 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's almost here. 4, 17, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Almost here. Matthew 10, 7, As you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Acts 1 3, Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem concerning the kingdom. And then the day of Pentecost is approaching. Acts 1 6, when they came together, they were asked, they say, Lord, is it time that you restore your kingdom? Acts 2, the church is established, and all references to the kingdom after that are past tense. For example, uh, let's see if I got a few of those here. I'll just name a few. Acts 8 12, 14, 22, 19, 8. 20, 25, 28, 23, and you got many of them. They're all talking about the kingdom in past tense. It's already set up. Revelation 1, verse 6, he, he says concerning us, and he made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We are the kingdom. The church is the kingdom, period. Okay. That's very, very simple. And so when we get together to pray, it's not about my kingdom, it's about thy kingdom. The focus of prayer is we're, we have to make sure that we understand the program. It's about him. It's not about us. Because there'd be no us if it wasn't him. It's all about him. So it's the prioritize. We can say, God, you are the king. Woo, but that puts me in the kingdom. I'm royal blood. Thank you, God. We can focus on that area then. But then you have uh, thy kingdom, thy will. Thy will is a result 
when we address the kingdom in our prayer. There are only two kingdoms. Kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. No man can serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. We don't purposely align ourselves with God's kingdom. Then by default, what other kingdom are we working for? We have to address that in our prayers. Then you have the provision. What's the provision? Well, that's the stuff that we like to have. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we have our physical needs. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, we have physical needs. And sometimes we pray for those physical needs. That can range from everything, anything. Lord, help the medicine to work, Lord. And Lord, help me to make the ends meet. Lord, Bless this food which I'm about to receive. We focus on the blessings. But see, back in the day, when they said daily bread, that's how you got your bread. You didn't have refrigerators. You didn't have a lot of ways and resources to fund all that. You just couldn't go into the freezer and say, okay, let's thaw this out. No. Daily bread. Daily bread. That, in fact, is rooted in manna. Remember they got manna. Uh, what is it? Exodus 17, when the cornflakes from heaven ended up on the ground, and they went out and they said, what is it? I don't know. Let's get Mikey to try it. You know, but that, it tastes like coriander seed. It was cornflakes from heaven. And they could make it. They could make patties with it, tortilla shells, whatever. But it all tasted the same. And then they were bellyaching about that. But daily bread. Now, we need to be addressing God. Now, notice where this comes prioritizing the program and then the provision. Wait a second. You mean prayer doesn't start out, Lord, I want this and this and this. No, 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 no. You start out with God. And the whole purpose, the reason why you're starting out with God in the prayers is because if you have a prayer, if you have a great big need, a great big need, you don't know what, maybe you got a test coming up. And you don't know what that test is going to say. And it's huge, and you're just like, I'm so afraid. Well, okay, what happens if you start bragging about God and his name and his kingdom and stuff? By the time you get done with that, and you put that on the backdrop of an awesome, awesome God, your need has become teeny, teeny, weeny. Amen. So it helps you emotionally at that point. Yeah. Because there's no problem big enough that God can't handle for you. He's already got you covered for when he pulls the cord. And you're going to be a lot happier at that point. So there's the physical need. We're to pray to God, give us our daily bread. We don't say, well, you know, I, I, one time I prayed for all my blessings. Well, they can stop. What happens if you already have the blessing? Then thank him. Thank him. That's all we have to do. Prayer isn't to be focused on me, myself, and I. It'll return to sender. And so, notice he says, give us our, our. You know, God wants us to pray in a way that is inclusive to all the saints. Because if you're praying for the needs of the church and you're in the church, then you come. Can you imagine how much harmony that builds? That God's going to help all of us. He's a big father. Lots of kids. But then there's the spiritual needs. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Man's greatest spiritual need is forgiveness. Without a doubt. Without it, we might as well stop praying. We're just condemned. Without forgiveness, we're contaminated with sin. God, he's not going to have fellowship with us. He can't look on us. Well, there's two types of forgiveness. There's the initial forgiveness, and then there's perpetual forgiveness. Initial forgiveness is when Peter says, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you. At the moment you were baptized, you took your belief in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and came up out of that water. God says, you are forgiven. But there's a perpetual effect to it, too. If we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There's continual scrubbing that we have. Because non-Christians commit sin unto death, but there's sin not leading to death. John talks about 1 John chapter 5. Because there's, nobody is perfect. Nobody has beaten sin on their own. Do you think, watch it, I, I get baptized. <laughs> Do you think this is like stupid? If I was baptized back in 1988 and I came up, was, did, did Jesus forgive me then? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Woo, I haven't sinned since then. <laughs> I was sinned before I got to the car. You know, that's why Jesus has that cleansing power. And the blood cleanses us continually if we're prayer walking in the light. We've got to continue walking in the light. And so we need to be praying for, for, for that portion of it. Lord, and by the way, as we forgive our debtors. In other words, there's contingency on it. You don't get a hold of garage against your brother and then they're thinking, well, I'll tell you what, God, he won't know that. He knows that. <laughs> oh, definitely. In fact, spiritually, it cripples you. Yeah. It absolutely cripples you. You know grudges, when you hold one, it actually is more harmful to you than the other person. Because it goes against you the entire time. You go to bed at night saying, and Louis, he like that person, and then you're driving down the road, and you got stinking thinking, and you, it just, it'll grind you down like a cancer. And so, spiritual needs, be praying for those. But then there's the emotional needs. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because once you are walking and you focused on the physical and the spiritual needs, the emotional need you have is to know that God is watching out for you. Lead us not into temptation because temptation is always laying around the corner. Right around the corner. Temptation is there. So we need to be praying, Lord, help us to see the ekbasis light. There's no trial taking you but that which is common. The man of God is faithful and not suffer you above that you are tempted. But with the temptation also provide a way to escape. Ekbasis. That's where we get the word ex. We need to be praying, Lord, man, we got a tough week coming up. Help me to make the right decision. Lord, help me. Lord, we appeal to God for the emotional needs. Because all the forgiveness in the world is no good if you don't have an immune system to then fight. Because do you think the world's getting less sinful? Do you really? I mean, are you that gullible? Now it's getting worse and worse and worse. That Satan can't wait to grab one of us. Satan's right here in this building today. Do you think that, that the recovering angel, Satan, Isaiah chapter 12, 14, 12, do you think that Satan doesn't have that power? Yeah. Lord, Please help us. Lord, help us to thrive for your kingdom. Lord, because I know the devil walketh about like a roaring lion seeking him. Amen. Devour. Lord, he steals, kills, and destroys. He's the prince of the power of the air. He blinds the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of God who is the image of Christ. Lord, please help us. Help us, Lord, to be strong. Physical, spiritual, emotional needs. Amen. You see, that all comes later. But then you have what comes next. The purpose. Here's the purpose of prayer. You want to know what it's about? Four. Four connects what was said before to what's coming after. It's directly connected. Four. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It's all about him. His kingdom. His rule, his reign in our life. Lord, this, this, see, we start with God, focus of God in prayer. We end with God in prayer, focus with God. And he gives us a slice to, to focus on what we need at that point. 
It's a spiritual sandwich. It's about your kingdom, Lord. And it's your power. I'm undergirded by your power. You're doing the loss. Your strength, Lord. Thank you, God, so much. And Lord, it's about your glory. It's not about my glory. It's about your kingdom, your power, your glory. Lord, you're awesome. Ooh, you're so awesome, God. And you're saying, well, why did you start that? Well, because the prayer is all about him. Amen. It never was about you. Yeah, you got a little bit in there, but in order to connect that to the power, you got to plug in both prongs, and you're right in the middle. Amen. And so when we're praying in collective worship, we should focus on these very things. So the conclusion is this. The first century included prayer in their corporate worship. They pray. When they gather together on the first day of the week, just as Christ commanded, just as it was taught, they 